Kane has given her invocation. And she taught me everything I know about public speaking. So I'm, I'm always excited to hear her speak. And how's nice. everybody else doing today? Oh. Ring the bell. It does ring, Terry, right? I've uh, been trying to see. There we go. <laughs> Yay. All right. I, I saw it strike. I didn't hear it strike, but I saw it strike. So we are now officially in order. If you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, the flag. I pledge allegiance. Pledge to allegiance flag. to the flag of the, of the United, United States, States of, of America. Of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And now the slide for the four-way test. This is the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? So thank you, everybody, and welcome to Rotary. President Steve is away celebrating uh, his wife's, his anniversary to his wife and his wife's last immunotherapy. He said I could share that. I don't mean to be a HIPAA violator, but maybe many of you probably don't, don't worry too much about HIPAA, <laughs> but that's kind of the world that I live in. Uh, let's start off with the uh, invocation. Cindy Kane. Thank you, Dr. Rob, our returning president. Fellow Rotarians, good morning. It's awesome to see your faces today and welcome to James Knight. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Father, today on my heart in particular is our fellow Rotarian, John Daly. We pray for his comfort, healing, and health. We pray that we all have more understanding and empathy, which is much needed today with all that we are faced with. Please offer James Knight and offer him your wisdom and bless the important work that he does for St. Edward High School and beyond. And then fellow Rotarians, I just wanna share with you something from Ralph Waldo Emerson because I believe it is important. Ralph Waldo Emerson, he said, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. He is rich who owns the day and no one owns the day who allows it to be invaded with anxiety. Finish every day, be done with it. You have done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities no doubt crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. Begin it well and serenely with too high a spirit to be cumbered with your old nonsense. This new day is too dear with its hopes and invitations to waste a moment on the yesterdays. Fellow Rotarians, let's go out there and make it a great day. Thank you very much, Cindy. Well, the board is given the go ahead to begin the hybrid meetings starting next Tuesday at Bounce. President Steve will have a letter in the mail tomorrow evening to give us details. The board did establish that we would have hybrid meetings with a waiver. So the details will follow for that. So that's exciting change of pace for this club who's been virtual for a long, long time. And it's also, again, time to make succession planning. One of the opportunities as the past president or the most recent past president is I chair the nominations committee. 
And the nominations committee is made up of myself, along with the five past presidents, uh, O'Neill, Margita, Sitz, Randall, and Sandy Narragon. We have had a brief meeting to plan our strategy to make sure that we are inclusive and that everyone who is interested gets adequately vetted. And our process is heading towards a timeline that will allow us to have a vote that still requires a signature via our bylaws. So we will need to vote in our meeting by December. So that's our timeline. What my ask is today is for you to nominate anyone you think of that would be good in the roles as vice president, which would then become president-elect and then president in three years, secretary treasurer. And as you see, Terry uh, has had that role for a while. There's not necessarily a retirement date on secretary treasurer, but we've had those two people in the role, but officially we need to nominate them as well as four new board members since the board limits have three years and people will be turning off. So that is my ask of you. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of the past presidents that I mentioned. Self nominations are welcome. For any names that we receive, I will personally call every individual that's been named to see if you have an intention to serve should you actually be nominated and elected. If you are, then we will have a series of virtual calls with the entire nominating committee to vet the, the candidates and come up with generally one to three slates of officers. So if they're in the qualifications are just to be a member in good standing, there is no time that you must have served in, the, in this particular club. Any questions about that? It's an exciting opportunity having just uh, finished up. I learned a lot and hopefully grew a lot. And I know tested all your patience a lot, but that's where we are. Well, thank you. Uh, David Hall, as our greeter, do you have anybody that you uh, wanted to call, call in? Uh, thanks, Dr. Rob. Yeah, I believe uh, Cheryl Mason is a guest, although her name looks familiar. She may have been a guest before, but um, Cheryl, are you there? I'm here. I'm um, from Jobs for Ohio's graduates, and I'm a guest of Candace Harmon. Very good. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining Thank us, you. Cheryl. I believe, Dr. Rob, that is it. No other guests at this time. All right. Do we have any ambassadors, anybody who has been to another Rotary meeting or get together? Let's see if I can check the hand function here. Cheryl's a jury duty. She's usually the one that we pull in. Julie Brandle, you usually have something going on in your district. Yes, uh, last night I participated on two Zoom calls. One was the, um, the Rotary Foundation Event Planning Committee for the district. And so if you'll mark your calendars for November 11th, uh, we'll have a um, district-wide celebration of our work with the Rotary Foundation. And... Um, it traditionally is like an ugly sweater kind of party. And so we've had like two, well, that I remember, I think I've been to maybe five of them. And I would say the last two were the most fun when they kind of went more casual. So I would put it on your calendar. It's going to be at Windows on the River in Cleveland, and it will be uh, Rotarians from all over our district. So I'm really excited about that. We'll be coming out with a theme here shortly. Um, and then the meeting right before that was the grants committee. So Sandy Narragon, if you're not familiar, um, she chairs the district grants committee. So she's doing some great work there, getting us organized at the district level. And um, I am so impressed with that committee. They do a lot of work. I can't even get over it. And um, Sandy from our club is in charge of them. So she's doing a great job. So that's what I've been doing lately. Well, thanks for sharing, Julie. Anybody else, uh, the ambassador? We'll move on then to our moment in history. Brian Chima, it's so good to see you. I haven't been able to talk to you in a while. Please, Dr. Take Rob, great to see you. Thanks so much. Can you nod if you can hear me okay? All right, great. And Dr. Rob, congrats on the Steelers' win over the Bills. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sure. for the surprise. I'll take it when I can get it. Yeah, great. Uh, Jerome Bettis, is he still playing? 
No, no. All right. <laughs> yep, that's my sports. All right. Uh, so we're going back to the year of 1957 to 1958. The uh, Rotary president was Claire A. Mance. Uh, this man uh, was the former president of Norca Beverages. Norca is Akron spelled backwards. Hey, you know, like I've been seeing Norca soda around Akron. I guess, have they like, have they reinvented it basically? And is it the same thing that it was back then? Or is this a totally new drink? And has, has anyone tried it? It, it, is, the, it, it is a new version of, okay. the, of the, it's the recipe yeah. now. And right. actually, um, it is uh, the the son of my former CEO and oh. the, the brother of one of our Rotarians. So he, he saw the sign, asked his dad what it meant. Yeah. He got all excited when he realized it was Akron spelled backwards. And he said, I right. think I'm going to do that. So I knew you'd uh, have a good story there. Thank you. Hey, do you all remember Norca Futon? <laughs> it's on West Market Street, right by St. V's. Yeah. Yeah. Norca Futon. Yeah, so Norca Beverages, Norca Futon. Uh, but anyways, let's keep moving. So what else happened in 1957? You're probably wondering. A lot of interesting things. I'm going to rapid fire to you. Althea Gibson won the Wimbledon Tennis Tournament, becoming the first Black athlete to do so. The Ford Motor Company introduced the Edsel. I had no idea what the Edsel was, and now it makes a lot of sense that band that used to play at Copley Circle growing up called Eddie and the Edsels. Keep in mind, they're still performing today, and they're going to be at Middleburg Heights on Thursday night. Uh, the first appearance of In God We Trust was put on U.S. paper currency. Uh, Leave it to Beaver premiered on CBS. Great show. Speaking of Eddie, Eddie Haskell. Uh, anyone? All right. The Lego company patented the design of its Lego blocks, which, by the way, are still compatible with new Lego blocks today. The U.S. Air Force Academy opened in Colorado Springs. Um, in the NFL, the Baltimore, the Baltimore Colts beat the New York Giants 23 to 7 in sudden death overtime. This game was labeled the greatest game ever played. Raise your hand if you've watched that game. Anyone? No, I, I haven't. All right, we'll finish it up with stuff that happened around the world. NASA was created. Uh, this was news to me. I'm kind of curious if you've all heard about this, but the Munich air disaster occurred. A plane crash killing, killing the Manchester United soccer team. Do you all know about that? It's nuts. Crazy. Three more. Syria and Egypt became... Uh, politically unified with the creation of the United Arab Republic. Uh, the microchip was invented by two guys uh, and developed and marketed in the US by Intel. And then last but not least, Elvis Presley was inducted into the army. And that is your Akron Rotary History Minute. Back to you, Dr. Rob. Well, thank you very much, Brian. We now have Akron Rotary After Hours. I don't know if Tamara is on board here, but I can walk through those slides. Terry, if you can pull those up. And if anybody who volunteered for President Steve, but I wasn't informed who you are, please don't let me take your thunder. But we have a couple of activities that are highlighted here and we'll put those in the newsletter. So Tuesday, July, through September 19th, we have bold color in the 1980s. It's free on Fridays and Saturdays. Break the cycle of addiction actually occurred, it occurs tonight at 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. at Stan Hewitt. And it's presented by fellow Rotarian, Chris Richardson. You can reserve tickets online or by phone. And though since it's tonight, I would probably give a phone call. Uh, on the 19th, we have history being made with Sing, Dance, and Joy at the John Brown House on Diagonal Road. And this is a concert that's got a lot of people highlighted there by the Ohio Arts Council, as well as the Summit County Historical Society um, works with this group it's an outdoor concert 20 bucks less than 20 bucks if uh, and you can uh, 
enjoy some time out in the in the nice air. Uh, our rack, Rackland Rotary After Hours, uh, we have a night out with fellow Rotarians in an open air patio of the Cigar Lodge. There's plenty of room indoors or outdoors if the weather were to churn to turn. You do not need to be a cigar smoker or, or a bourbon drinker if you want to uh, meet up with some friends. So all are, all are invited, the address is here. The Akron Women's City Club, presented by fellow Rotarian, Geraldine Wojno Kiefer. Residencies, Reflections and Rememberings is a retrospective exhibit of landscapes and maps dedicated to Bruce Kiefer. And the hours of the gallery are 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And there'll be a reception October 16th given by Ginny Wojno. And this uh, will ensure uh, it, it shows historical reproductions, sketches, and artwork by, by Dr. Kiefer's progress of making, which is soaked watercolor papers and coffee based solutions, then drawing or collaging over them. Sounds interesting for those of us who uh, used to dabble in, in the arts. And that is what's happening around town. Now, is anybody happy, in addition to me, since Brian Pima already called me out, I, I will put 10 happy dollars in because it may be one of the few weeks of the season that, that the Steelers are the only uh, winner in this region for uh, football as the, as the Browns are looking scary good. So who else is happy? I am. All right. Susan, how happy are you? Well, I'm too, uh, how happy am I? Okay, well, how about $10? All right. Okay, I'm happy because um, Steve is out of the 11 day hospital stay and he is uh, recovering from an infection and is now in um, a care facility where he's doing rehab and we look for him to get out soon. So we're excited about that. And the other $5 is because, oh, and David is arriving Thursday too. So a uh, son, David. So we're happy about that. And then Saturday, I'm competing with the Dragon Dream team in a race in Lorain, Ohio with the Cleveland um, uh, dragon boat team. So we're ready to go and roll. And if anybody's uh, available Saturday morning and want to watch the dragon boat races, it's on the Black River and Lorraine. So there's a park there. Just come and, and watch. Nine o'clock. All right. And uh, thank you, Doc, uh, Doug Cole, for teaching me how to say Jenny's last name, and it's why no, it's a Akron Polish name. And I apologize as a Pennsylvanian, I, I, I missed that chapter. Thank you, Doug. Anybody else happy? Oh, I see Cindy Kate's hand up. Hi, sir. I am very happy because tonight we get to go to the Rotary Camp at five o'clock and we plan on showcasing our Rotary Gym and talking with people who would like to get involved in some way in camp. So if you, my fellow Rotarians, are not busy tonight, we would love to see you and spend time with you at camp. Five o'clock today. And I can... Oh, I'm $10 happy, did I say? Thank you, that's good. And I can attest that the, the gym is awesome and especially when you can do the, uh, the travel through the trees. That was a nice uh, add to the camp and it, it's pretty exciting. Uh, I, I will share also that we met this week, I guess it's an ambassador moment, but we had Katie uh, Miller, Steve Bowie and I, along with Mella and Dan from camp, met with representatives from LeBron James Foundation to explore some opportunities for us to partner with them. We're, in some sort of a um, opportunity to have respite for some of our inner city youth who had a lot of trauma through COVID and violence this past year. So stay tuned. That was kind of a fun to get fun to give them a tour 
and they were very excited about what we have going on out there as well. And uh, Thane, always happy. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. So I see Mela's online. Mela, am I allowed to be happy today? Because I think I owe you like $53 in happy dollars. You can always be happy, Thane. Okay, yes. so <laughs> I'll add uh, four more happy dollars. And that's just for some folks. Um, we've already mentioned them, their names today, then some more people that I'll talk about in a second. But I've been in the club now coming up on, I think a little over four years, it's going to be five years. I'm very blessed to have uh, been mentored by people um, and uh, had the opportunity to get some advice from folks who really helped me uh, really embrace the Rotary Club and get connected. Uh, John Daly is a guy that sponsored me to become a member. I know he's having some health issues, so I have a ha happy dollar for him and also I'm going to keep him in my prayers. Rob McGregor, my Rotary mentor, leading us again today, so I have a happy dollar for you. And then I have two more dollars, one for uh, Tom Knauer and Pat O'Neill. Um, as I get more involved in the club, um, you could call it volunteering or you could call it uh, getting voluntold. Um, I'm, I'm going to be doing a little more work this year for the Chili Open. So I was going to uh, meet up with both Tom and Pat uh, to get their advice on uh, some of the committees and positions they've been in with the Chili Open. So really appreciate you guys. The best part about being in Rotary is getting to make friends and volunteer along. Uh, get to volunteer alongside some great people. So I'm happy for all you guys. And Mela, you can add that to my tab. All right. Any other happy dollars? That's a pretty happy group. Dr. Rob, I'm happy. All right, David, uh, tell us. I got uh, two happy dollars. Uh, one for Akron uh, Zips the men's soccer team who continues to climb the national ranks. Uh, they tied Indiana last week, 1-1. Uh, it was an exciting game. Indiana was uh, either number one or number three in the country, depending, I guess, what rankings you looked at. So um, very, very, if you had an opportunity there, they remind me of the 2010 championship team. They, they're, they're a lot of fun to watch. And then my uh, second dollars for my daughter's soccer team down at Flagler uh, College in Florida. They uh, continue to win and, and maintain their number one ranking uh, in Division II women's soccer. So happy for her as well. well congratulations. That's excellent. And we'll see a, a run a run for uh, uh, the championship in, on both sides. That's awesome. Are there any other announcements? This was a quiet week coming up for birth dates in our club. We've got a single birthday and it's Jim Mullen. So if you see him, his birthday is on the 20th. And we have no join date anniversaries this week. That's very unusual for this club. So it's all spotlights all on Jim Mullen. So you can tell him happy birthday and we give him some crack about getting older, but he's young enough not to be, to be phased by it. I, I will just repeat because I made the announcement at the front end that this is our last planned virtual meet, total virtual meeting. And next week, the board has given us license to move forward with our plans to be virtual hybrid in person at bounce. So there'll be details coming out by President Steve on uh, tomorrow evening so that get ready to do that. And Julie Brandel met us, forgot, Friday Open M, volunteering from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. And what will we be doing, Julie? Sorry, we are going to be um, doing a food distribution. It's called the Mountain of Food. And so they uh, have, I'd say over a hundred people coming to pick up food. And so we'll be making up baskets and um, distributing these baskets to families in need. So it's from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. this Friday. And I know I sent out an email, but I haven't seen many takers, if any at all. So if uh, anyone wants to come with me, please don't let me be alone because that would be a lot of food for me to do all by myself. <laughs> so um, invite your friends, your family, any, anyone can come. So you have to wear a mask and you have to socially distance as much as possible, but they have a lot of work to do on Friday. So if they can get volunteers, they need 30 to 40 volunteers to make the event um, as streamlined and as efficient as possible. So if they have 10, they have 10, but if they have 30 to 40, it's ideal for them. So let me know, thanks. All right, for those of you who have openings on your schedule Friday, please jump on that. Now I'd like to have the speaker graphic. 
because it's my pleasure to introduce someone who has already influenced our club as we've been trying to look at opportunities to enhance our diversity and inclusivity and equity. Uh, Mr. James Knight is the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion at St. Edward High School. He is an educator, a coach, slash mentor, a consultant, an author, an itinerant speaker, teacher, and equity and inclusion strategist. Much of, it, much of his work is revolved around leading with humility and partnering with other leaders to build dynamic, inclusive communities, spaces where people collaborate, innovate, and engage in fearless dialogue. We were fortunate enough to be introduced to uh, Mr. Knight by the Cleveland Club, who was doing a series of seminars and we were able to tag team on there and, and buy our way into two positions that Karen Herlicka and Tom Knauer uh, participated in a series of seminars. And we're looking really, we're, we're really looking forward to what you have to offer for us here today, James. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So is it my turn? I can take yeah. over? Yeah. Awesome. Well, let me share my screen. Well, thank you for allowing me some time to share something that's dear to my heart. And so a little bit about me, I am James from Chicago, born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. And I came to Ohio in 97 um, to do my undergrad at Oberlin College. And at Oberlin College, I met my lovely wife. Um, we've been married, I don't know, 22 years now. She's from California and um, we have five boys. One that's, um, that's a junior at the University of Chicago. He just landed a an offer from Goldman Sachs. And then, um, then I have two boys here at St. Ed's with me, um, a senior and junior. Um, so I'm back at the college search right now with my second one. And then I have an eighth grader that'll be here next year at St. Edward. And then I have a five, a six year old who runs the house. And so I have starting five, <laughs> five boys, right? So, um, but it's a pleasure to be here with you to get to meet you. Um, hopefully it's not my last time, but this is just the first of, a, of many opportunities to be able to work with you and to get to know the fine members of your club. So a little bit about kind of how I came to this. I came to St. Edward about six and a half years ago and I was a parent and my son was a student here and I just wanted to help out. I wanted to just volunteer um, and part of the reason why I wanted to do that was because there were really, there wasn't anyone African-American that was working in the school and the school was becoming more and more diverse. And so I wanted to be able to be there as a resource. And what happened as a result of that, that conversation turned into an opportunity for me to consult the school. And so consulting saying that for about six months, the president said, would you mind working here? Would you mind creating an office of diversity, equity, and inclusion and building a program? And so at that time, I was working on my doctorate degree, and I stumbled upon something called cultural humility. And it just really, real, it just really aligned itself with our Christian values here. And I felt like this is the way in which we should approach how to manage the diversity that was happening at St. Howard High School. And so if, if for, for any of you who have my book, I tell this story. What you see here is you see two fingerprints. You know, my son kind of helped me develop this logo. The idea was that you would have a fingerprint. It represents two people from two different backgrounds coming together to form heart. So really what I like to say is that I don't think that my work is like DEI work as much as I think my work is heart work. And so what I seek to do is really try to touch people's hearts and transform it. But to give you a little bit, about this framework and how it came about. Um, cultural humility came about in the late 90s as an alternative to cultural competence. And so most times when you read about announcements as it pertains to DI or diversity training, you usually hear the word cultural competence. 
And so two African-American doctors in LA in 1998 coined a phrase called culture humility. And part of that was that they felt that what was the kind of diversity training that was happening in the healthcare field, they felt like it was lacking something. They felt like cultural competence was contributing to healthcare providers being maybe arrogant, maybe engaging in stereotypical thinking. And one of the things that they were proposing is that culture is very fluid. It changes a lot. And so sometimes when we use the word cultural competence, and because words are important, it can give us the impression that we could be competent in another person's lived experience. And so they came up with the term cultural humility to suggest that this is ongoing, that this is a lifelong journey, that we must always maintain the posture of a true learner and the posture of a student and give others the opportunity to teach us. Now they tell a story, very interesting story, which really led them down this path. There was an African-American nurse working with a patient. This patient happened to be Latina. And the African-American nurse, while well, she was working with this patient, the Latina, the Latina patient just got out of surgery and she was in a great deal of pain. And the nurse kept ignoring her request for more meds. The doctor shows up. And the doctor is like, what's going on? Why hasn't the nurse been responsive? So the doctor has a conversation with the nurse. He says, why haven't you listened? Why haven't you attended to the needs of this patient? And the nurse responds, she's okay. And the doctor says, what do you mean? She says, I just had a cultural competency training on Hispanics. <laughs> and in that cultural competency training, they told me that Hispanics overexpress pain. This patient is just overdoing it. And this is what led them to this term, culture humility. And when I began to do the research um, in graduate school, I began to think about how important this is and how relevant this is to education. And so what you see on your screen is you see three tenets. The first tenet of culture humility is what I call lifelong learning and self-critique. And one of the things that's so critical with culture humility is that we engage in self-awareness, that we begin to look at ourselves and examine ourselves to see what ugly parts we might have that we might be blind to, that we might not pay attention to, that might not be serving us in this present season. Jesus has this great analogy, right? When he says, before you take the, the little speck out your brother's eye, right? Why don't you move that big old two by four out your own eye, right? The plank out your own eye, right? And so a lot of times it's easy to try to, you know, judge others or to try to fix others and say they need to work on this. But how about the first question that we ask is, how can I change? Where can I grow? I always say this, you know, there's a quote I love to quote, um, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. And so we have to choose on a day-to-day -day basis to grow. Um, the second point that they say after we engage in self-critique and begin to examine what things we might have that we might need to unlearn or let go of is this need for mitigating power imbalances. One of the things that's inherent in the physician-patient relationship is that there's a natural power imbalance. You think about, you go to the doctor, the doctor kind of tells you what you should do take three of these. As a patient, you don't question oftentimes because the doctor is the expert concerning the body. But in healthcare, the doctor needs the patient to be comfortable because the doctor needs to say, what's wrong? How are you doing? Where do you hurt at, right? The patient needs to be comfortable enough with the doctor to be honest. And what we know as adults, if we don't have that relationship with our doctor to where we feel comfortable, we usually will switch doctors. Now, the reason why this is so important in education and other areas is because a lot of school systems, students can't choose to switch teachers. Not everyone can afford to go to a private school, right? And so school, kids are stuck, you know, at certain school districts and certain situations where they have teachers that may not be aware and that may not be serving them, right? And so when we talk about power imbalances, one of the things that the doctors were proposing is that when you are a leader, a servant leader, you're in the, um, the service field, it becomes so important that you are aware 
other dynamics that are impacting the communities that you serve. And understanding that those communities are bringing into your world a set of issues, um, things related to trauma. And so it becomes important that we begin to be aware of how power moves in certain environments and that we're careful about how we use our power. And, our, and, and then the other question that I would say, are we using our power to lift are we using our power to bring about change and so forth? The third tenet that you'll see is institutional accountability, but really at the heart of that is what they're saying is you have to develop strategic partnerships. At the heart of culture humility is how do you begin to center the voices of others, particularly those communities that may have not had a voice, those that are on the margins. And so a lot of times in social services, in a number of areas in our world, we often are trying to fix people, fix situations, but we have not developed partnerships from the very people that we're trying to help. And so that's a big component is this notion of humility and how powerful humility can be in helping us to become more effective. Um, a quote I love is by C.S. Lewis. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. And that's really at the heart of culture humility. One of the things that I say is that when you begin to lead with humility, you make transparency and authenticity possible. So what's happening essentially in a lot of environments is that not everyone feels as though they feel comfortable enough to be authentic, to bring their authentic self, or even to be transparent. And so this is what we're trying to do when we're talking about this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're trying to build the kind of spaces where people can show up and they don't feel like they have to fake it to make it, right? They feel like they can bring their authentic self. And this is not something that's an issue for just people of color or minorities. This is something that every person is looking for, safe spaces, places where they can bring their true self. So this is the why, right? I found this interesting graphic. This is Maslow's hierarchy of inequity, not Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But we are all probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But what was happening when I first started at St. Edward and a lot of institutions and universities that I work with, one of the things that we see when we do the data, we do the research focus groups, is that depending upon what community you come from, when you're entering into certain spaces, you may have a much steeper climb to experience safety. And not just safety in a generic sense, but safety in a psychological sense. You know, when we want students to engage in calculus, they might have a hard time reaching the top of this pyramid because they don't feel safe, but they may feel like people are judging them, people are looking down at them. We want students when they come to St. Edward, particularly, this is what I've been working hard to do, is to feel like they belong. But we do understand that if I'm a black kid coming from the east side of Cleveland, right, we make that assumption, right, which is a stereotype, if we make that assumption, so oftentimes when we do the research, this student has a much steeper climb to be able to feel like he or she belongs here at St. Edward High School. And a lot of that is because we have clashing of cultures. We have um, different ways of worship. There's a number of things and so forth. And so one of the things that we've been able to put in place here is we've been able to put a model that's rooted in humility. I personally believe that what the world needs right now is a vaccination of humility because we're more than black and white, red and blue, right? Jew, Gentile, whatever word we wanna to use to classify ourselves. But humility is so necessary in this hour because oftentimes people don't listen. People assume that they know. And so people you know, are not having meaningful dialogue. And so this is the why, this is why we do this because we don't want people to have this steep climb to be able to experience this idea of belonging and to be able to feel like they're safe. And if this doesn't happen, if we're not intentional about trying to address these things, what happens is we have a back door and then people leave and they don't stay in our club, they don't stay in our organization, they don't stay in our company. The thing that we know from data and from research is that when you feel comfortable, when you feel like you can bring your authentic self, that's when your creative self shows up because you feel like your voice matters. If you don't feel like your voice matters, you won't bring your creativity. You won't bring your gifts and talent. You'll just do just enough, right? And so what we want is we wanna be able to build the kind of spaces where people 
can bring their full self and their best self. There's a quote that I love from a song where she sings, she says, how are you gonna win when you ain't right within? And this is what this is really all about. It's about getting right within ourselves so that we can be able to create win-win situations. Simon Sinek talked about a great thing on his podcast. He said that skills direct behavior for a known situation, but when you get in an unknown situation, skills don't apply. And this is where attributes shine. And he was talking to CEOs and you know, business folks, and he was saying that really what we need is attributes. Oftentimes we can try to look for skills, which is, which is necessary, but when we get in unpredictable situations, situations that are very fluid, um, and, and we have in our world right now, we have a, a, a very, we have a world is shifting a lot in terms of multiculturalism. And so what we really need to look for is we need to hire for humility. Humility is an attribute that allows folks to be able to adapt and to be able to adjust. One of the things that Albert Einstein said was really powerful. He says, the only thing that's more dangerous than ignorance is arrogance. I don't know about you, but it's hard to be around arrogant people, people who think they know, because people who think they know, they don't listen. You can't tell them anything. And so when we talk about that, think about this from the place of culture, because we, we, we probably all will agree that humility is a very important virtue. But what does humility look like as it pertains to culture? Do I feel like my culture is better than another person's culture? Do I, with my body language, demonstrate to those who are outside that their way is not better, right? That their way is less than my way and so forth. Now, we don't say these things explicitly, but there are things that we do that demonstrate that. Um, and so one of the goals of culture humility for me that I say is to create spaces for healing. And the reason why I use the word healing, I use that word intentionally because in a lot of work environments and a lot of school environments, is you have people that have been traumatized by racism, by whatever ism it might be, that are coming into our, into our job environments, that are coming into the school, and they need a space to be able to heal. And so, you know, especially in education, right? In light of all the things that's been happening, we wanna to try to build that kind of space. And equitable learning, you know, that speaks to the fact that we're meeting people where they are. Um, and so that's the goal of Culture Millie, right? To build that kind of space where everyone is seen, heard, valued, loved, and supported, right? So we want to move past the tokenism. Oh, I hired a person of color. That's just step one. But does that person feel like they have a voice and do they feel included? And are they fully participating? This is the goal of why we do what we do. So in my research, I created this wheel. This is the framework that I've been using at St. Edward and other organizations and companies um, as a way to really build safe environments. At the heart of this wheel is what I call others over self. What really gets culture humility moving is when you begin to start thinking of yourself less, like that C.S. Lewis quote, right? And then what you see around this middle circle is what I call the will fill skill process that if you have a desire to learn, you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna learn, right? <laughs> You're gonna get more cultural knowledge, right? And then with that knowledge that you get, you can begin to apply that knowledge, right? You now have the skill. What is happening is that we have folks that have, that have grown up in homogenous environments that have not been able to develop the, the, the cultural insight, right? That's needed to be able to move into multicultural environments. One of the things we know from research is a lot of data that, that's linked to this, that when people are intellectually humble, when there's a, 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 a intellectual curiosity, it, it, it allows them to be smarter because they don't assume that they know, right? And this is what we're trying to cultivate, this growth mindset, right? This, this mindset that's not fixed, but this mindset where you allow others to teach you. Um, you know, one of the things, a great example I like to use, right, is that at a school, you have a kid, right? Maybe the kid comes with a do-rag on, right, to school. If a kid has never been in this kind of environment and doesn't have his intellectual curiosity, it's easy for that kid to stereotype a kid with a do-rag and say he must be a part of a game. Well, why? Because he was watching Boys in the Hood late Saturday night, right? He saw Ice Cube with this on and he's connecting these things and so forth. 
So this just doesn't happen with white to black, this happened to black to white. This happened in so many different scenarios, even with Muslim and the number of situations because media and the noise around us is feeding us. And if we're not careful to, um, to be conscious, to educate ourselves, sometimes these things can get inside of us and we can develop biases. Um, so when we move around this wheel, the thing that I always tell people that you gotta remember is not always about you. And the other thing that I always like to do when I'm doing trainings is that I like to let people know it's okay to not know and ask questions. It's one of the things we had to do here when I started. Um, because one of the things that's happening right now is that there's so many ways to approach DEI. You know, how do you go about doing it? Everybody has a way. And, you know, one of the things that I see is I see people doing this work and they're shaming people. They're making white people feel bad. You know, white people don't want to ask questions because they don't want to, I don't want to seem like I'm racist and so forth. This shouldn't be that difficult. We should be able to assume good and assume that people have um, good hearts and people want to grow from that. And so what culture humility does, it creates a safe environment for people to be able to learn from each other and to be able to exchange. When we go over here, one of the things I always say is that you got to know thyself, that you have to become a lifelong learner of what moves you so that you can bring your best self. Now, over here, when I, when I talk about understanding that we all have unique worldviews, one of the things I think is really critical is that we have to teach not just our students, but our adults, that we're equal no matter our culture. And that's easier said than done. But when we're unconsciously living this out, sometimes we will look down at people based upon how they dress, based upon how they talk, based upon the things that they do. And then we assume that knowledge only comes from one direction. And we put ourselves in a place where we can't learn from everyone. And so this is what makes humility very powerful is that we, we, we can get the blessing of, of, of multiple perspectives, multiple ways of seeing the world. Um, learning what's most important to others, I love this part right here, is because what I find in a lot of organizations is that people are just so busy. And because people are busy, they, they, they struggle to cultivate empathy. You can't cultivate empathy unless you talk to people. You have to be patient, right? There's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting story here. I was reading a book the other night. Um, it was talking about the word busy. And the word busy in Chinese um, comes together with two characters. They define the word busy um, by two characters. The first character is something like this, and it means hard. And the second character that kind of compounds this word busy in Chinese or Mandarin is this word to destroy. So the word busy in Chinese means to destroy heart. And I find in a lot of organizations, the reason why people are struggling to be included is that we don't make time for everybody. It's easy to make time for those who look like you, those who agree with you. And so because we do that, we destroy relationships and we destroy hearts. And if we take this down to a very close situation or example, think about a marriage, think about your children. If you're too busy, you'll destroy heart and you'll hurt the relationship. And so these are just the fundamentals, right? We know this from, you know, Bible, whatever religious background you are, these are just fundamentals as, as it pertains to human relationships. And so diversity is a matter of how we relate to each other as humans. And so we have to cultivate empathy by learning what's most important. I always talk about this, right? We all know of the golden rule and it, do unto others as you will have them do unto you. But today I wanna introduce you to the platinum rule. And the platinum rule says, do unto others as they will have done unto them. But in order for you to do that, you're gonna to have to cultivate patience to be able to talk and learn about those communities. One of the struggles that happen oftentimes in pl places where I go to work, they feel like, well, this is how I wanna be treated, but you're from a different community, right? Those communities that you're serving might have a different culture. They might have a different way. So that's where the humility comes in at for us to be able to learn and to be able to, to, to have them teach us. Um, and the leading part is where I say, you gotta, you know, you gotta amplify the voices that, that are not usually in the room. You gotta amplify the voices of diverse communities, right? You gotta know what other people feel, what they think, 
And I would say even silence. Silence is so dangerous and, and, and can be weaponized when we don't speak up, when we see things that are inappropriate or things that might be hate, you know, hate, you know, in terms of just putting others down and so forth. And so this is kind of the will and we kind of build our framework on this. And so what you see here, one of the things that we did here as I began to kind of close and open up for questions at St. Edward, we begin to take students, we're going to take students who, who, who would fall in like the minority category in a sense. Maybe the student was Muslim because we're predominantly white and predominantly Catholic and Christian, but we begin to talk to students who were part of the LGBT community, students who were African-American, students who were uh, Muslim, students who were Hispanic. And we begin to have students talk to our, our, our administration, our leaders. We had students talk to our teachers. And it was a very powerful um, lunch, you know, a series of lunches because they began to have voice and they began to express what they were feeling, their experiences, things that were happening. And what this did was it touched the hearts of our teachers. It touched the hearts of our leaders. Again, this is hard work. Um, we can't move forward and move towards building a very inclusive environment unless we begin to open hearts and touch hearts. We did surveys, we followed up, we debriefed, and we began to build a model and put things in place, or at least I did, right? Um, and then what we did was we began to educate our adults and we began to educate our students. You know, I think part of the problem that we are probably dealing with in our country is we wait too long to talk about important things. And so we wanted to start talking to kids about what does it mean to lead with humility? What does it mean to learn from others that are different? And we begin to have really good conversations and begin to introduce our students to culture humility. And not only that, we begin to bring parents into the building. We had to bring all stakeholders and get their voice and begin to even be transparent as an organization and let them know that we're on this journey. We're not experts. We're walking with humility and we're asking you to be very much a part of this process. And so I had our president, you know, there so that he can be in a room full of parents of color and, and know what that feels like and give the parents of color a space to be able to share and to talk about the things that were going on. And so these are some of the strategies that we put in place. And then we had some retreats with parents and board members to be able to talk about things that we don't like to talk about. And then we brought parents together from different backgrounds. How often do you see that? Well, you have white parents and African-American parents, and we're talking about culture humility. We're talking about the things that divide us and the things that connect us. And so this is a growth moment. And so we begin to bring all parties, you know, a part of it to really begin to make this framework strong so that we can lead with this. So that when people are coming to choose to choose Santa as a school, they knew that culture humility is a framework that we use and put in place to be able to talk about issues pertaining to racism, um, discrimination, um, belonging, social justice, whatever that might be. And so what I did over the last year is I wrote a workbook um, that Karen has probably shared with some of you. And this workbook begins to really break that wheel down throughout the book and it gives you a series of activities where you can begin to talk about it, you know, and you can begin to grow from an individual level and also from a group level and so forth. So um, I appreciate you guys for giving me some time to share a little bit about some of the things that I do. And um, yeah, so we can open it up for questions. Thank you very much. This was really inspiring. And Thank you. I, I have to recall one of my first encounters when I moved to Ohio was with the Amish elders and they gave me a very similar message that don't don't ever be prideful be grateful and I, I thought good. that that was an important message that I heard come through in in your message today so Thank do you. we have uh any questions here Dave I'm going to ask you to man this I just got a a text from the governor I apologize uh, James I'm I'm part of the Ohio Children's Hospital 
group yeah, of, uh, yeah. that has to help the governor and the school districts weigh in on how we can slow down COVID in the kids. So I That's apologize. Good work to do. So I am going to adjourn the meeting, but then flip it over and hopefully Dave Hall and Terry can continue with questions. So awesome. may, I have, may I have the bell, Terry? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Or not, I can just say ding and turn the official part. Oh, now. Sorry to catch you off guard, Terry. Heard it. I heard well, it. I'll tell you what, I heard it too. I just rang the bell and we're officially adjourned, but please stay on and get to ask James some, some great questions. and. I am so sorry that I got double booked here, but uh, have, a, have a good day, everybody. Thanks, Rob. Good thanks, luck. Rob. Good luck. So, James, thanks for hanging around. Appreciate it. Uh, we usually, kept, like uh, Dr. Rob said, maybe uh, five, 10 minutes, um, if that uh, yeah. allows for you. Um, we do have a question in, in, in the chat here. Uh, how does one balance humility while also having pride in oneself and culture? Yeah, that's great. That's a great thing. You know, I think, you know, culture humility gives room for that to be able to be proud about your culture and so forth. I think the issue is when you become arrogant and you impose, right? You know, it's kind of the whole idea of colonization in the sense of like, you know, I'm just going to take over and I'm going to force my way upon you. I think really culture humility, what it suggests is partnership, like a marriage, right? You know, you know, it's like, I want my wife to have a voice. You know, we can't have pizza all the time. You know, she likes vegan, <laughs> you, know? you know, it's like, you know, it's a marriage, uh, it's a give and take. So that's where the power dynamic, that second tenet of culture humility, right? When we talk about power, how power moves, those who have it, they have to be willing to humble themselves and share it to a degree, right? To empower those who don't have it so that they can begin to be co-creators be a part of that partnership and so I think that's what you do when it's when we're talking about humility and you know you know being confident being proud of what you are who you are but also giving space for others to be able to share um you know what what's unique to them you know I think oftentimes we just we just struggle with the balance very good thank you um got a lot of messages in here just saying thank you great presentation um uh, one of our members says, I agree that humility adds a great deal to the concept of intercultural competence. Thank you for doing uh, the research and the study. Um, Cindy, go ahead. Do you have a question? I do not have a question, but I will say I have been through a lot of diversity and inclusion training, and this by far is the smartest presentation I have seen. I really appreciate oh, wow. the approach. And it's really, really good. And I really appreciate you. Thank you. That's a great comment, Cindy. Might have to get you to write something to put on my website. <laughs> I'd be happy to. I really would be happy yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, please do. You know, you, you can't beat that, right? Cindy, you know, she's like, I've been through a lot of, of these and this is the smartest way. Oh, that's so, that's so awesome. I appreciate that. Touch my heart. Okay. Um, Looks like we got another question, maybe as a multicultural melting pot, is there an American culture? Is there an American culture and can it be positively promoted? I agree, I think so, right? I'm proud to be American. You know, I think culture is, is fluid, it shifts a lot. I think, I think it's just a lack of humility again with that, right? You know, even when we, you know, let's use our school, for example. People sometimes say the school is changing. It's not like how it was when I was here. You know, we like to say, do you want it to be the same? <laughs> right? Like, like you know, it's, it's young people, right? You know, it's kind of like when your parents said that music sucks, right? And so forth, right? Um, things change, things shift and so forth. And so, you know, when we talk about American culture, you know, I think, again, it goes back to the power, you know, that those who have power, right? They, do they define that this is American and this is not American, you know, I think that's where the struggle comes is that people are, you know, we don't have common language about what's American culture. 
And I also think the struggle comes too sometimes when we think that America is better than other places, you know, and we have not been in other places to be able to really understand their context. So we always have to be careful, right? You know, you know, as a Christian, you know, my interpretation of, of my faith and, and the Bible, you know, when what I see Jesus, I see Jesus humbling himself and coming to the least of those to be able to understand them, to be able to build relationships. And I think what makes this model really awesome, Cindy, is that it has kind of the spirit of Christ in it, in the sense of like, you know, how do I, as a person who might have privilege in a certain context, right? Because, you know, white privilege don't exist in other places, right? Doesn't exist in every situation, right? Some situations might be black privilege, might be athletic privilege, privilege shifts, right? But, but whatever it is, depending upon what power I have, what my position is, I just want to be mindful. I want to be thoughtful that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm able to build trust with those that I serve, that I'm able to build a level of comfort that they feel like they can fully participate. So that's what I try to do when I work with people is try to understand the context and just try to, you know, just, I really think it's a human issue, right? It's a leadership issue when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Good leadership is inclusive. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question, um, James. Yeah. Uh, just, I, I, um, I, I like your concept, but how do you deal with, how, how are you received uh, from, from different cultures that are traditionally uh, male dominated or, you know, have, uh, you know, humility is just maybe, I don't want to say a foreign concept to them, but it's just it's, it's difficult to receive. How, how do you introduce that concept to them and get them to respond to that? Yeah, you know, you try to find those things that people connect and value. You know, humility is really awesome in the sense like, you know, a lot of people like good to great you know, by Jim Collins, and he talks about level five leadership, um, you know, how, how it's, it's tempered with humility, that the leaders that have the most profitable, successful companies that people admire, when they do studies on these great influencers, humility was one of the characteristics that was common, it was a common thread. And so when you have those environments, you know, you bring in people and you bring in the research too, you know, there's a lot of people's doing research, you know, the Harvest Business Review, has a lot of articles that talk about this, you know, about intellectual humility and just how humility has to be um, interwoven in anyone who's going to lead people. So that's, I, I'll use that at times, you know, you try to get a feel, you know, for whoever it is you're working with and so forth, you know, um, and you begin to you try to explain to them, you know, how diversity can be profitable, you know, and because you have to begin to deal with the, there's a stereotype out there that it that I think sometimes we see diversity diversity as being costly. It could be like a liability, you know. They won't be as talented. They won't be as good, you know. It, it seems weighty and so forth. So you have to begin to shift that because again, people are going off of things that are in the environment. There are things in the environment of America in this world where where it, it's not always contributing to us being what I'm preaching about, right? And so you have to begin to try to open people up to that and begin to move them, you know, down this continuum and also let them know that there will be some things that will be uncomfortable because there are some things you might have to let go. I love my parents, as I think everybody on this call does, right? But let's be honest, there were some things that we might've been taught that might not be serving us in this season. You know, and so there's some things that I have to say, you know what, there's some things I probably have been holding that's, I'm very partial, you know, and I probably need to begin to deal with that, you know, deal with some of the parts that I have within myself. But I think sometimes folks are so busy that they may not take the time to engage in self-critique and self-awareness. Have a strong marriage is important to me. You know, my wife is always reminding me of my ugly ways. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm, 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 I'm having to listen to her and, and to adjust and to grow. And I just take, I just take some basic principles that I learned at home, being a father, being a husband. And, you know, these principles work in organizations, you know, listening, you know, giving other people a voice, um, 
not thinking that my way is the way. Um, but that's hard though. When people are successful, you know, and I work with folks and they're in business, they've been in business for a while and, you know, they're very successful. There, there's just some seeds of arrogance that they, they, they struggle with to let go when it comes to some things. And, I, and that's what we have to begin to own that and address that. Very good. Very good. Thank yeah. you. Very insightful. Thanks. Um, one of our members wants to know what your plans are uh, post uh, your, your doctorate program. Do you, do you have any plans for after that? Well, yeah, my, so, so I would say over the last year or two, my business has really grown a lot. You know, I'm kind of transitioning, um, you know, from St. Howard um, into a part-time role. I've been kind of consulting and talking with people around the country um, and doing a lot of work with my book and stuff like that. So for me, this is kind of what I feel is like a part of my calling or, you know, just to be able to help and work with leaders you know, to share this message. Very good. Very good. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just have a conviction, you know, that I, I think, you know, I'm just not sure everybody's going about this the right way. And I, I want to help people. Excellent. Um, someone else is asking here, do you have an email address? I believe it was in your, your, uh, one of your slides there. Um, yeah. I just typed it in the chat. Yeah. James at Lee with humility dot org. Okay. Can you hit enter? I, I don't think it popped up. It didn't pop up. You know why? Yeah, because I think. Or did you send it to one person? That's fine. Yeah, that's why. Here it go. Here it go. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, James. There we go. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions before we adjourn? Thank well, you guys James, for sticking around, right? <laughs> thank you, James. It was very, very great. Very good, good presentation. Appreciate it. I appreciate thank taking you. the time to talk with us. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Everybody have a great See day. See you guys. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.